the church? Amen. 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 You hear me just fine there? <laughs> all right. All right. I see a lot of frowns. I still see a lot of frowns. Okay. I don't know. It is a Sabbath day. Amen. I'm happy to be here. Uh, as you've heard that introduction, and uh, Mr. LaFosse, we're going to have to talk after this, uh, <laughs> after this meeting. Uh, yeah. Anyway, praise the Lord to be here. Uh, the schedule actually says I'm supposed to be winding down the sermon right now. So, uh, I don't know what that means for you, but I thank the Lord for the health message. You're probably lost right now, right? We are taught to have a very big breakfast in the morning. Yeah, so I hope you had a very big, big breakfast this morning. I drove almost three hours to get here. So we're going to study. Amen? Amen. Now, if you did not have breakfast, uh, you better start praying. Let the Lord give you strength. <laughs> Is that all right? Amen. Well, with no further ado, uh, we will go ahead and get started here. Uh, we have a very exciting message, at least to me, and I hope that you will be blessed by it. Uh, before we get started, let us, uh, let us pray. You bow your heads where you are, and I will kneel up here. Father in heaven, we are humbled in the extreme to be called your children. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your grace and your mercy, and for bringing us to this place this morning. We thank you for the beautiful Sabbath day. We thank you for breath in our lungs, gift of life. But most of all, we thank you for Jesus Christ who came to die and save us from our sin. Father, this morning as we get into this message, a message that you yourself have given, we ask for your Holy Spirit to fill this place, touch our hearts and our minds. Father, I present myself to you I ask that you may cleanse me, touch me, speak through me. Father, when all has been said and done, if everyone here will forget my name, that's fine. But Father, let them not forget your name. So we thank you and we pray to this end. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 When I ask for the theme for this She's a little bit laughing. When I asked for the theme for, for this Youth Day, um, and when I received it, uh, I was very excited. I was very excited, and I looked at the scripture. Beautiful, beautiful scripture. Amen. Have you looked at the scripture for, for today? Right? If we confess our sins, he's what? He's faithful and just to what? Forgive and what else? To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is a beautiful, beautiful text. And so uh, I sat down very quickly. I was very excited and I started jotting down some notes, bringing out my Bible. I've got highlighted passages. And I was very excited. And then it hit me that, well, maybe I should kind of pump the brakes a, a little bit here and, and consult with the Lord. That's always important. Yes? Mm -hmm. So when I got to praying and, and, and uh, uh, studying a little bit more and listening to to, to the Holy Spirit, I felt a different tug to my heart. Now, we are still going to be talking about reality check, yeah? Mm -hmm. Reality check ahead. However, the Lord redirected me from what I was so excited to present to you all this morning to what He wanted me to present. Now, there are many times, for some of you that are, that are preachers and pastors, you know that there are some times when you have, you're so excited about a message, but God says, no, I want you to preach this message. And so I want you to know that today's message is coming straight from God. And I hope that it makes you uncomfortable. I hope that it makes you uncomfortable. Because it made me uncomfortable. When I started looking at 1 John and, and praying through it and I said, Lord, we need to, to talk about your grace, your salvation, your love. He said, son, that is fine. However, there's something else that I want you to talk about. I said, well, what is it, Lord? And he said, go to the book of Jude. See, I was in, uh, in the book of 1 John there. He said, just go one book over, right? Go to Jude. 
Look at verse 3. Now go in your Bibles, Jude chapter 1, it only has one chapter, verse 3. It says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. Of what kind of salvation? Oh. Of the common salvation. That doesn't mean that it is cheap salvation. It means that salvation which is familiar to you. When I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. Do what, everyone? Contend. Earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Jude is saying when he wanted to talk about salvation, when he wanted to talk about the love of God, the grace of God, God said, hey, I want you to, to tell my people to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Now, that threw me for a loop. I was like, well, what is going on, right? So as I, as I was praying through, you know, going through that whole process, a friend of mine called me up and says, hey, uh, have you checked the news? I said, no, no, I, I have not checked the news. He said, okay, well, don't mind. I'm going to forward you something. And he forwarded me an article. He forwarded me an article. Some of you may have seen this article. Uh, it was on CNN. And he was talking about how millennials are leaving the church. Did you see that this week? You know, it brought a smile to my heart this morning when, when I walked in, I was sitting right over there, and uh, a gentleman, he, he's not here right now, but I believe he's a pastor, he made allusion to that article. And then I knew that God had sung. I always look for those little pointers whenever I speak to see if God is with me, and he confirmed it. He says, this is what I want you to talk about. We will kind of talk about that article as we go. But the title of this morning's message is A Question of Identity. A Question of Identity. And our opening text comes from the, uh, the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation. And thank you for this, uh, uh, to this young man who read it so eloquently this morning. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. If you go there in your Bibles, I don't see any Bibles opening. I'm going to give you three seconds to reach for your Bible. You're going to need it this afternoon. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. It reads, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of his seed, which keep the commandments of God, commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus. Now, I invite you to pay very close attention to this part of Scripture. If, if you are familiar with Revelation chapter 12 at all, you will understand that this last verse of this chapter is basically a summary, right? Revelation chapter 12 basically deals with, uh, it, is a, it is a distillation of the cosmic controversy. Some of you may have heard the, the, the term great controversy being thrown around, and we're not talking about the book, Great Controversy. We're talking about the theme, Great Controversy, that war, that battle between good and evil. And Revelation chapter 12 is a distillation. And everything comes to a climax right there on verse 17. The dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have what else? <laughs> have the testimony of Jesus. I have a question for you. Who is the woman of Revelation 12? The church. In what specific time? In the immediate context of Revelation 12, 17, yes, the woman is the church, but in what specific time? I'll help you out because of time, yeah? The church in the time of Herod, in the most immediate context, right? There are other applications to this verse, but in the most immediate con context, it is the church in, in, the Herod, in, in, in the time of Herod. How about the seed? Who is the seed? Jesus is the seed, right? 
Now, if you're not familiar with all of these, we won't get into a detailed uh, uh, exposition of all of those things, but if you have questions, if you want to study, talk to me. I can send you some, some material. You can, you can study this, right? So the seed is used. How about the remnant? What is or who are the remnant? And you went silent in here. I hear the Christians. I hear the church. Uh, who, who has a different response? Well, John gives us two identifying characteristics of who those people are. Number one, they do what? They keep some of the commandments, yeah? All of the commandments. Characteristic number two, what else do they have? The testimony of Jesus. What is the testimony of Jesus, by the way? And where do we find that at? Revelation 19.10, actually, right? If you've been to a Revelation seminar, that's one of the key texts that we use to, 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 uh, to basically bring about the identity of, of who the remnants are. Now, if you, if you read Revelation 12, it is a title, you will be struck with the fact that it is imperative that we accurately identify who the remnant is. Historically, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has interpreted this scripture to refer to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, to this body of believers. That is the historic consensus. I want to go on record today as saying it is not only a historical, historical consensus, but it is also the biblical answer as well. Now, we must come to grips, friends, with this Revelation 12, 17 bit because there are some in our ranks who want to do away with this idea of the remnants because it is, a, they say it is elitism. They call it triumphalism. It is not polit politically correct. Friends, we are not interested in what is politically correct, but we are more interested in what the Bible is actually teaching in this verse of Scripture. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. There's a Christian author, his name is uh, C.S. Lewis. Some of you might, might be familiar with him. C.S. Lewis, Lewis once delivered a series of radio lectures that were later compiled to a book that is known as Mere Christianity. Some of you may have read that book. In the third chapter of that book, Mr. Lewis makes a compelling case for the identity of Jesus Christ. Now, You've got to understand this point that I'm about to make because the whole message hinges on this. Okay? So, uh, I, I like to not only appeal to the spiritual side of my audience, but also to your intellectual side. Is that okay? It is okay to think on the Sabbath. Yes? You know, sometimes we have so we have so much going on in the week that we're constantly thinking. Uh, I, you know, I work in the software engineer and we think all day. Right? That's what we do. And... We are very well tempted when we get to the, to the Sabbath day that we want to rest and just turn off the mind. Don't do it. Don't do it. It is perfectly fine to think logically and rationally on the Sabbath. So I'm going to appeal to your logic. Amen? Follow me. Mr. Lewis makes a very compelling case. He says this, right? He says... Based on the claims of identity that Jesus made about himself. Based on what? On the claims of identity that Jesus made about himself. He is necessarily logically thrust into one of three categories. Mr. Lewis said Jesus was either a liar or he was a lunatic. Or he was the Lord. Do you follow the logic, yes or no? Based on the claims that he made about his own identity, he was logically thrust into one of three categories. Either a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord. 
We cannot place him innocuously into some category as a spiritual teacher, a philosopher, or a religious guru because, watch again, because of the claims of identity that he made about himself. He is either a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord. That is a cogent messianic apologetic for you theologians in the, in the crowd. Let me offer you another one that follows the same line of reasoning. Except this one is going to be a biblical apologetic. Based on the claims that the Bible makes about itself. Notice again that element, that claim of identity. Based on the claims that the Bible makes about, makes about itself, the Bible is one of three things. One, it is either fictitious, fallacious, or factual. Are you with me? Based on the claims, right? That is to say, fictitious meaning it is a fairy tale, right? Fallacious meaning it teaches that which is not true even though it purports to teach what is true. Oh, factual meaning it is the inerrant word of God. Now hang on to your seats now because we have the, uh, the messianic apologetic from C.S. Lewis. We have the biblical apologetic in effect, the fallacy of fiction. Let me give you another one, a third one. This one will be an eschatological apologetic. Based on the claims that the Seventh-day Adventist Church makes about itself. What claims do we make about ourselves? We just read it in Revelation 12, 17. The remnants, right? Based on that claim, and young people, I want you to pay attention. It is youth day today, right? Yes. We're going somewhere with this. Based on the claim of identity that the church makes about itself, it is of necessity one of three things. We are either wrong, or we're ridiculous, or we're right. The historical claim of the church is that Revelation 12, 17 refers, refers to this body of believers. And of necessity, because we make that claim, we are the right, or we are wrong, or ridiculous. My contention today is that the church's historical claim of our identity is the right one. And today, we want to go ahead and, and try to unpack that, right? This is not grandstanding. This is not grandstanding. We'll dive into this concept and, seek to, and seek, to, seek to unpack it from a biblical perspective. Remember, reality check ahead, yeah? Keep that in mind. Keep that in, your, you know, in the back burner, if you want. Our topic being a question of identity. And if I were to offer you a thesis for this presentation, it will go something like this. Identity drives mission. And mission, in turn, strengthens identity. Does that make sense, yes or no? Mm. Identity drives mission. And mission, in turn, strengthens identity. This is where everything hinges, friends. Because the Seventh-day Adventists, we must firmly understand our true identity in the eyes of God. If we are to rise to the occasion of being part of finishing the gospel work, this is imperative. This is important. We must understand. Now, we will look at three biblical instances Two success stories and one miserable failure to bring our point across. Our number one success story, we want to look at the man Jesus Christ himself. Go in your Bibles with, you, uh, with me to the book of John. Again, I don't hear any pages turning. Unless if you have memorized the whole Bible or you have some gadget in your hand of some kind, right? We need to get into the Word of God, friends. John chapter 17, 
And I'm going to start from verse 1. Are you there? Amen? Amen. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his, his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou, which thou gavest me to do, and now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I want you to, to pay very close attention here to two things. Jesus' Jesus' mission on earth was based on his identity as the Son of God. If you look at verse 4, I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do, there is the mission. Right? His mission was to glorify the Father on earth. Jesus says, I have done that, mission is complete. That is the mission, right? And look at the identity, verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. And there is the identity. Jesus knew who he was. And that knowledge, and that knowledge strengthened his mission. And he was successful. Can you say amen? amen? We are here today because Jesus was successful in his mission. Jesus responded, he said, Suffer it to be so now, for it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And then John the baptizer baptizes Jesus. And as soon as Jesus rose up out of the water, what happened? There was a dove, right? There was a voice. What did the voice say? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Notice what is happening here. The father is investing identity in the son. Mm. The father is confirming the identity of his son. Right? That is Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 4, right? Jesus is going right into his ministry. When he gets out into the wilderness, what is the first word that the tempter say to him? If you be the Son of God. What was Satan trying to do? He was trying to discredit. He was trying to pull the rag out of Jesus' feet of who he was. But Jesus clung tenaciously to his identity as the Son of God and his mission was successful. Can you say amen? Amen. I want to read you just one sentence. From Desire of Ages, page 112, one sentence. This is what Ellen White says about this very occasion. She says, these words of confirmation, talking about that voice that was heard, these words of confirmation were given to inspire faith in those who witnessed the scene and to strengthen the Savior for his mission. So the Father here confirms the identity of Jesus and inspiration says those words were to strengthen Jesus for his mission. It is very important, young people. Now, I'm young too, right? Maybe you don't see it, I don't know. <laughs> I think we have, well, say for, this, for the front row here and the parents, we really have more like high school, college, freshmen, yeah? Yes? No, yes? Oh, shut your head, no. Okay, very good, very good. You are at a time where you have a lot of pressure being put upon you. Now, how do I know this? I was your age once. Now, I'm not far removed from there, okay? I was your age once, and I've been to college, right? I went to, uh, I went to a state college, I went to Purdue University, and that is a very worldly campus. Very worldly campus. Now, I grew up in this area, it's actually my mother's still in in Niles, Michigan, I lived here. Right until I moved away. That when I went stepped on that campus, friends, it was the first time I, I met someone who claims to be an atheist. I had never in my life met someone like that, and I had no idea how to relate to that person. And so as I as I go out there into the community, into the society, the pressure 
of conforming to what the world says you are is great. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And young people, if you are not sure of you of who you are in Jesus, you will fall for anything. Oh, yes. mm. Jesus clung tenaciously to his identity as the Son of God, and he was successful. That was instance number one. Let's move on to instance number two, another success story. Go to in your Bibles to the book of Acts. To the book of Acts, and we want to look at the apostolic church. The book of Acts, chapter one, starting from verse six. When they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times of the seasons, which the Father has put in his own power. Note verse 8, and note not carefully. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the world. Just as the Father invested identity into his Son, Jesus turns around to his group of disciples and he invests them with identity. Now they have this, uh, they have a sense of their ecclesiastical divine identity appointed by Jesus on them. Now if you read the book of Acts, they went out and preached they preached so much with power that the hierarchy of that time wanted to do away with them, right? They were offended because the disciples were preaching with so much power that they wanted to do away. They called them thorns in the flesh. They was like, let us do away with the thorns in the flesh. Jump in the book of Acts. Go with me to chapter 5. Chapter 1, Jesus invests identity into his disciples. He says, you will be my disciples. You, be my, you will be my witnesses. Chapter 5, starting from verse 27. And when they had brought them, then is the, is the disciples. And when they had brought them, they sent them before the council. And the high priest asked them, now listen to the charge. Listen to the charge that is being levied to, uh, against these disciples saying, did not we strictly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. 29, then Peter and, all, and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than what? Rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hung upon a tree. Him has God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. Watch verse 32. And we are what? We are witnesses of those things. And so is also the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey him. <coughs> Notice their response, right? Where they are being charged no longer preaching, preaching his name, but their response is, our identity necessitates this as our mission. Mm -hmm. We are the witnesses of the grand and glorious things that we have seen Christ do. Amen. All because Jesus had taken the time to invest identity into them now. A word to the parents. Now, I am not a parent, right? But if God were to bless me, if God were to find me faithful, mm. I'm getting married in a few months. Yeah. Mm. So, and kids are in the picture. Amen. If God were to find us faithful, so much as to bless us with kids, it would be my studied effort to invest identity into my children. Amen. Mm. Amen. The article that I was reading on CNN, that was basically painting this grim and sorry picture of Christianity. How millennials are leaving the church in droves, right? Over the, over the past seven years, Christianity has dropped down 8%. Mm -hmm. While this atheism, agnosticism, and all these other things are blossoming, they are booming. And the question is, what is happening in the church? Why are young people leaving the church? 
Of course, the, 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 there, was, the, there was a multitude of responses and people had their own opinion. That is well and fine. But there was this one person. Man, he hit the points. He hit the nail on the head, right? He said, yes, millennials are to blame for leaving the church. Yes, the leaders of the church have taken part of the blame for millennials leaving the church. But he said the, the most blame lay, lays squarely on the parents. Amen. Friends, if you have not taken the time to train your child up, the Bible says train up a child where? in the way that he should go, and when he is old, what will happen? He will not depart from it. He says the blame lays on the parents. Friends, if you have not taken the time to instruct your children in the ways of God, if you have not taken the time to invest identity, to teach your children how much they made in the eyes of God, you will not know how to respond to that question that God is going to ask you, where are the children that I gave you? You know, I heard during Sabbath school, a lot of our young people have questions. Yeah? Did you hear those questions? Those were very valid questions. Those were very valid questions. Friends, our young people are intelligent. They are thinkers. They look at your behavior. Now, I thank, I thank God for my parents. Right? My mother is here. I thank God for my... Now, I'm not saying my parents were perfect parents. There's no such thing as a perfect parent. But they did their best to raise my brothers, my sister, and I in the ways of God. Now, of course, we had our own crazy thoughts. We would run to the left. But I can promise you that my parents were on their knees praying for their children. The father took time to invest identity in the son. Jesus took the time to invest identity in his disciples. Two success stories. Now, let us look at a miserable failure. An example of what not to do. And to really appreciate the import of what we're going to look at now, let us go to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 4. And what I'm going to do here to kind of paint a picture for you, I'm going to read a larger part of, uh, of Scripture down just to kind of lay the backdrop. Deuteronomy chapter 4, starting out. Oh, yes, chapter 4, starting from verse 5. Now, this is Moses speaking to the children of Israel. Verse 5. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do so in the land whither you go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all the statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who had God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that had statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which is set before you this day? Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen. And lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life, but teach them to thy sons. And thy sons, sons, especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in horror, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me and the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children so. 
And he, and he came near and stood under the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire unto the midst of heaven, unto the midst of heaven with darkness and clouds and thick darkness. And the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. Ye heard the voice of the words, but so no similitude. Only ye heard the voice. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them upon two tables of stone. Moses here is recounting to the Israelites that you are a peculiar people. You are the covenant children of God. God has given you statutes and judgments and ordinances and particularly there's Ten Commandments, that great superstructure for the government of God. You are the people, the, com the commandment-keeping people of God. Israel had a mission. They had what? A mission. They had a mission. What God had done here through the hand of Moses, God had invested them with identity as the covenant people of God. He said, I have given you statutes, judgments, commandments. Keep them. This will be your righteousness in the sight of the people. Israel had a mission. And that mission was to live with excellence. Not only to leave excellence, but to be such a bright light in the dark world that they were living in. So glorious that all the nations around their periphery will repudiate their national sovereignty and annex themselves to Israel. That was God's plan for his people. But that mission would fail if Israel was to forget their identity. Oh, yes. Everything hinged on Israel knowing and being confident of who they were. Now, let us go now to, I don't even know how to describe this verse. It is the strangest, saddest verse that you will read in the Bible, Second Kings. 2 Kings chapter 17. 2 Kings chapter 17, starting from verse 32. Now this is hundreds of years later, after God had given, after God had given the Israelites their charge, their mission, their identity. Starting from verse 32. So they feared the Lord and made unto themselves of the lowest of them priests of the, high, of the high places, which sacrificed for them in the houses of the high places. 33. They feared the Lord and served their own gods after the manner of the nations whom they had been carried away from this. Does this make sense to you? No. It says they feared the Lord but served their own gods. How is it possible for such a paradox to exist? The very people that God invested identity into to fall so far from the mark as, as to start worshiping their own gods. Jump down to verse 41. This is the very last thing that we hear about the ten tribes, the nation in quotations of Israel. So these nations feared the Lord and served their graven images, both their children and their children's children, as did their fathers, so do they unto this day. Let the reality of that statement sink into your mind. The very people that God had given the Ten Commandments, that great superstructure to the government of the Lord, the very people that God himself invested identity. Listen to what the SDABC, the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, says on this very scripture. Listen very carefully. It says, thus ends the history of Israel 
a people who should have been a peculiar treasure to the Lord and above all people. Never had a people started out with greater promise. Never did a nation meet with greater humiliation and reproach. Israel discovered by sad experience that righteousness exalted the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Watch this. Little is known of the northern tribes subsequent to their being taken into captivity. Many probably merged with the people among whom they lived and lost their identity. How is it possible for such an egregious paradox to exist? It does not make any sense for Israel vested with identity from God to fall so far away to be so blinded to their perversity and sin. Mm. Friends, that is what happens when we forget who we are. Oh, yes. That is what happens, young people, when you take upon yourselves what Hollywood says you should be. Oh, yes. That is what happens church, when we do away with the identity that God himself has given us. Oh, yes. Amen. That peculiarity. Being different from the world. Yes. Is there a lesson for us in these three instances? Yes or no? Is there a lesson for Niles, Southside, Seventh-day Adventist Church, in those passages, yes or no? Yes. Friends, if we lose our identity, our mission will come. If we do not embrace our identity as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, now, there is a difference between a Christian and a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Now, I know that's not a popular word to say today, right? We are all about, oh, let's, let's get together. Friends, we are not saying we need to look down on our people. That is not of God, right? However, God has given us a message. God has given us a peculiar message that we have been charged to carry to the world. Yes. Amen. Now you tell me, if we don't even understand our own message, if we don't even embrace our own identity, how in the world will we ever be Like I say, I hope this message makes you uncomfortable. Because God has called a people who are to be peculiar and stand out, not blend in, young people. I will tell you a story. When I was, you know, uh, I used to take summer classes. And I will go on my campus. I have this shirt, little, little t-shirt that I wear. It has uh, 2 Timothy 3.15 on the back. And up front here, it says, I'm in the army of the Lord. I wore, I wore that intentionally, by the way. And I will go to my secular campus, right? Totally overtaken by the world. And there's this one spot on campus that if you stood there, people will know that you are a Christian. No one else stands on that, on that spot other than Christians. So I'll go there and I'll stand on that spot, got my shirt on, you know, not bothering anyone, and people will come up to me, and they will ask me questions. Well, why are you people so judgmental? Right? They'll go along those lines. And we'll talk, right? And maybe, you know, some young people that have, that have chosen the alternative lifestyle will come up to me and say, well, I don't like yoga because he doesn't like me. Because I have chosen to, to be what I am. I can't change it. And friends, if you are taken over by being politically, politically correct, you will not stand in those situations. Oh, amen. 
I have friends. I love them dearly. They're not Adventists, they're Christians. I love them dearly. And many times we have theological discussions, right? They say, well, the Sabbath, you know, the, the, yeah, the Sabbath was done away with, you know, yes, God uh, ordained the Sabbath, but it really doesn't matter when you worship God as long as you worship God. Mm -hmm. Have you heard that argument? Mm -hmm. Friend, if you don't embrace your identity as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, you will just not say, you know, oh, that's fine, yeah, you know, you go to church on Sunday, I go to church on Sabbath, it's all fine. Friends, that is not to say God does not love other Christians. He does, and you should too. But God has made things clear in his word, has he not? That we as Seventh-day Adventists must be strong in standing by. I'm going to give you six pillars on which our church, on which your Christianity, your Seventh-day Adventist Christianity, Christianity stands or falls on. Six pillars I'm going to share with you, and then we'll close. Anybody feeling uncomfortable yet? Six non-negotiables. What did I say? Non-negotiables. Non-negotiables. We cannot have a discussion on those things. The Bible is clear, and all the questions have been ably answered. Pillar number one, the scriptures. Either the scriptures are the inspired, inerrant word of God, or they are not. And if the scriptures are not inspired by God, we might as well pack up our bags today and head home. Non-negotiable, young people. If you don't take time to study your Bible, if you don't take time, young people, to have devotions in the morning, there is no way that you will know your Bible. A, a pastor friend of mine once told me this. He says, friend, you need to know your Bible well enough to know when someone is misquoting it. Did you catch that? You need to know your Bible well enough to know when someone is misquoting it. Friends, we have people, men of the cloth, who will use the Word of God to gain their own means. And friend, if you go to church, remember, I, I, I admonish you this morning to put on your thinking cap. So if you go in there and you sit down and say, well, he's coming from the pastor, he has a tie and a suit on, he must be fine. Mm -hmm. for a rude awakening. Check me out. Whatever I say, you go home and you study it. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? Amen. The scriptures. Non-negotiable. Amen? Amen? Ellen White says this in the fifth volume of the, of the testimony. She says, the Bible was written for the common person. You don't need to have a degree to understand the Bible. Oh, yes. Amen? Mm -hmm. Now, education is important. I'm pro-education. But you don't need to have a degree to understand the Bible. You only need to pray and study. Non-negotiable. Number two, the Sabbath. Non-negotiable. Non-negotiable. Friends, the Sabbath has no significance if, this is number two B, right? The Sabbath has no significance if the earth was not created in seven literal days. I appreciated the children's story, right? Teaching the children about creation. The world is overtaken, and even some of the church, they're overtaken about with the science falsely called this theory of evolution. Friends, you and I did not materialize from some prehistoric swamp. You are the handiwork of God, made in the image of God, and God rested on that Sabbath day. Someone say amen. amen. And he gave a commandment. Commandment number four, what does it say? Remember the Sabbath day to do what? To keep it holy. That has never changed. As far as I can tell, 
from Genesis to Revelation, I've asked many of my friends, and say, well, brother, I will come to you to church if you can open in this book and show me where God changed. I'm still a Seventh-day Adventist up to this day. No one has been able to show me that. Non-negotiable. Pillar number three. The second coming. Now this might not alarm you in any way. But friends, some of us are sleeping. We say, oh, Jesus is coming again. That's why I said when, when I was five years old and now I'm 40. Oh, how old are you? Friends, I believe that Jesus is still coming. The world is, over, is, is overtaken about, you know, with this nonsense that, oh, this, this realized eschatology. This is what they call it, the realized eschatology. Basically, it means that when the Bible says Jesus is coming and the scribes will roll back by the scroll, it basically means that when Jesus comes into your life. Friends, Jesus is coming in person. This is not some theory, right? This is not some illusionary story. He is coming, and that is a non-negotiable. After all, we are Seventh-day Adventists. Mm -hmm. Non-negotiable. Number four, the state of the dead. The state of the dead. We need to be crystal clear on this issue, young people. We need to be very clear that God was telling the truth when he said, you shall surely die mm. to Eve, which ate of that food. The world is overtaken with this nonsense of, of, of spiritualism. And not only outside, but it's creeping into the church. The majority has bought into that lie, friends. But it is Satan who invented the fascinating uh, theology of you shall not surely die. God said you surely die. And he was not kidding. Right? Mm. The state of the dead is non-negotiable, friends. We do not believe in anthropological dualism. We do not believe that the soul or the human soul is eternally immortal. Non-negotiable. Pillar number five, second from last. The sanctuary and Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ's ministry there. Friends, if we try to do away with, with the sanctuary message, we are literally taking the foundation away from Adventism. If we want to do it, we might as well just pack up our bags and go home. The sanctuary and Jesus' ministry there is a non-negotiable. You know, all of these new attacks, I don't know if, if many of you follow along with, with, with things that are happening in the high echelons of ministry, all of these new attacks on sanctuary truth and the ministry of God, those are not new attacks. Those are just Desmond Ford and Ken Wright re revisited. Friends, that horse is dead. We can stop kidding. Those questions have, have been ably answered. That is a foundation. And if you are not sure of what the sanctuary is, friends, you better get into it. Call up your mom, call up your dad, sit down, and if the parents don't know, you need to study as well. Amen? Amen. Non-negotiable. Number six. The last one. The spirit of prophecy. Non-negotiable. Our main text was Revelation 12, 17. And what were the two identifying characteristics of the remnant people? They keep all the commandments of God and have what? They have the testimony of Jesus. And Revelation 19, 10, 19, 10 says the, the, the testimony of Jesus is what? It is the spirit of prophecy. It's in the Bible. Let's control the page out. It's in there. Non-negotiable. And friends, the ministry of Ellen White. Now, a lot of people cringe nowadays when they hear that, that name, Ellen White. They cringe. Search it in your heart. Search it in your heart. Either that woman was inspired by God, and, or she was not, and I believe she was. She was inspired, and she's inspired. 
If all we have is just a glorified, uh, you know, just a, just a random, a random writer, then we're in trouble. I believe that God inspired the woman, and she is inspired. Now, young people, if you have ought against those righteous, maybe someone has bashed you upside the head with a with a quote or two. Listen, don't take that out in God's promise. Amen. Amen. Just because someone misused her rights, don't take that out in God's promise. You go pick up steps to Christ, and you sit down and you pray and say, God, if this woman was inspired, you show it. And I promise you, God will show it. Now I'm going to go So what is the reality check? Here it is. Do you know your identity? Do you know who you are in the eyes of God? If you cannot answer that question, with all the vigor that you can muster. Then, my friends, you need to set some time to be with Those things need to be worked out. We are seventh day Adventists. And friends, that is not to be proud of. That is, a, that is not a grandstand. It is biblical prophecy. <coughs> And I want to tell, I want to share with you this. That even in this body of belief, not everyone is part of the rent. That is a sad reality. That is a sad reality, friends. I know it's not easy, it's not a popular word. Maybe your heart is beating, you just want to run up here and you ah. That is why I love the verse for the day. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive. Not only that, but to cleanse us. We get a brand new slate. We get a brand new slate. I'll leave you with one quote from the Spirit of Prophecy. Uh, Testimonies to the Church, Volume 4, page 595. This might be a hard one to swallow for some of you. But you take it up with the rule. Here's what the Spirit of Prophecy said. It is as sure that we have the truth as that God lives. It is as sure that we have the truth as that God lives. Now to some, that is not an acceptable statement. Especially in the times that we live, right? Yes, we believe you're correct. Don't you step on your toes. Friends, we have a high call. We should be friends. We should be loving. We should be kind to our people. But like Peter and the world, right? Acts 5, 29. We would rather obey God rather than God. The, the millennials are still leading the church. Why does Niles Southside and some of the other church be full that is my challenge to you. We have these young people here, adults. Look at them. They are your children. God has entrusted them to you. What will you do to keep them in the church? Amen. Young people, you have a part to play. Some of you may be going away to college. Praise the Lord if you're going to Andrews or Oakwood or some of the church schools. But if you don't, do you have the foundation that will keep you grounded for the next four years? The Christian principle. I want to pray with you this morning. 
I'm a young person too. I'm only 32 years old. I still have a long life ahead of me. Amen. Mm. And they need God's strength to follow him. And as much as this message is being given to you, it was given to me first. And I wasn't uncomfortable. But I want to pray for us today, parents and young people. If you want to make a commitment to God, and now, I'm not about popularity, okay? No show. If you don't mean it, stay seated. These are letters of God. No small thing to try from the Spirit of the Lord. But if you have it in your heart, you want to say, Lord, I might have lost my identity, but please reinvest me with my identity. And restate the mission. And keep me as I follow you. If that is your prayer, you, you stand up. I want to pray with you. I'm right here. I'm the, I'm the first one to stand. God has called a people that will stand up and be bold and complete this mission. Father in Father, like Daniel would say to us, belongs confusion of faith. We don't know to how to come in or go out. But Father, you have given us such a grand mission. You have called us to such a lofty standard. But Father, we fail to do it on our own. Our Lord, we trust in you because you have told us that greater is he that is within us than he that is in the world. Father, you know our faults, our failures, and our foibles this morning. You know our weaknesses, Father. You know we have gotten lost. And here we are, we stand. Help us, Father, to stand for your call. To stand bold in this dark world. Harder times are coming, Father, and you just cannot stand now. When it requires our blood and our lives, surely we won't be able to stand. So we ask, Father, that you may strengthen us with your spirit. May this reality sink into our minds. That you have called us to be different. Us to finish this work. Thank you for the young people. Some of them are in high school, some in college. Oh, Father, that you will send your spirit to them. That you will strengthen their faith. I pray for the parents, Lord. None of them are perfect. They have done their best. Oh, Father, help them. Help them to be found faithful. When you come, ask me, where are the families that I gave you? May they have a positive answer. And we pray for this church and the leadership. Oh, Father, that you may give the leadership wisdom to stand as watchmen on the walls, to protect the flock from the things that will try to creep into the church. Rebuke the devil, O oh Father. May he remain far from this place. But Father, our highest desire this morning is that when all has been said and done, that we may hear your lovely voice saying to us, Well done, my faithful servants. You may enter into the joy of the Lord. Oh, how we long for that day. Help us, Father, to that end. So we pray in Jesus' name.